Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about muzzle discipline. It may or may not come as a surprise to you, but live fire ranges are not really conducive to realistic training, and real bullets are not really conducive to realistic training. There's a lot of artificialities in the way that we train, and we have to accept these artificialities because to ignore them is to be unsafe. And while there are some instructors out there and some shooters out there that you'll see post videos or, or put out information otherwise, uh, they, they're willing to take more unsafe risks uh, to reach a point uh, because they feel like the risk is worth the reward, even though using other systems such as simunitions or UTM can get the same result uh, in a much safer way, which is why those systems exist. And they have their own artificialities anyway. Um, you can't completely remove the safety factor from training. Uh, and while some risks can be taken in training because there is a much greater reward and the, the risk itself is more esoteric than realistic, uh, we still have to obey the rules uh, and we still have to make an effort in the way that we train and the way that we practice to be as safe as possible at all times. Because most of the ranges my, my viewers are going to have access to have their own rules in place, go far beyond the four cardinal firearm safety rules. If you shoot, if you only shoot indoors, you're very, very restricted in what, what you can do, even approaching realism. If you have an outdoor range, such as the one I'm on today, uh, you may have a little bit more, uh, no pun intended, um, but literally speaking, range of movement, ability to move around and do things. Uh, another factor that we have when it comes to realism is target design. Uh, target design hasn't changed in any real meaningful way in a very, 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 very long time. In fact, the majority of the targets you're going to see and probably till the end of time see are your two-dimensional paper targets. Some of them try to be photorealistic, which they're not. Kind of a separate conversation. But ultimately, kind of where I'm going with this is the fact that it's very, very hard to replicate situations that you may find in real life. You'll look at these targets I've got set up behind me. It's kind of a loose gaggle of three-dimensional shapes. My personal feeling, uh, most of you know, uh, three-dimensional targets are the way to train as realistically as possible with live fire ammunition. Again, I can't make these targets any more realistic than they are. Um, besides making them hit reactive, which is something I can do with these. I can put balloons in the high thoracic or the head, so when shots go there, the balloons pop, the targets drop, which is a little bit more realistic, but still, I can't make them behave like people. They're not going to give off the um, uh, visual facial cues, movements, things like that. Clothing is something you can add, um, but you're not going to get the human interaction from these targets. So they still are pretty unrealistic, but I'm already worlds ahead of setting up something like this um, than if I tried to do it with two-dimensional targets, which really just is so unrealistic, it's almost not worth it. Because no matter what situation or, or arrangement you put the targets in, they're all two-dimensional, functionally two-dimensional. So they're all going to be facing you, or you'll be get a flank shot on a two-dimensional target, which isn't very realistic at all, because people are three-dimensional. Um, you can probably look at this situation that I have set up behind me and immediately identify, well, some issues with being able to discriminate uh, and effectively reach your bad guy if there was a bad guy in that crowd. So let's say I did have a bad guy back there. One guy with a gun. He's in a crowd of people. Now if they become aware of his presence, he fires off some shots, people are going to react predictably. Uh, generally they're going to do one of three things uh, just based on experience and, and uh, the videos that are out there of shootings. Of course this is very anecdotal, but you're going to have people who flee uh, either uh, upright or cowering or, or trying to go to cover, which is you know safe for someone who's not able to defend themselves or defend themselves immediately. Uh, they're going to freeze and kind of stare in disbelief. Uh, and of course, these days you might have the occasional person pull out a phone and film, and um, which is how we get some of the videos we get of shootings, which isn't necessarily the wisest thing to do, but uh, I'm kind of glad they do it if they do it as safe as possible because it gives us more and more and more anecdotal data which helps us as, sh as shooters and self-defense minded people get better at what we do. But I think you can immediately see some of the problems. Depending on what angle uh, you are from the threat, the known threat, the identified threat, positive identification, your ability to access that threat immediately uh, with your firearm is complicated by the fact that you've got uh, no shoots, if you will, or innocent bystanders in the line of fire. So even if you're pointing your firearm in the specific direction of your threat, you still have no shoots downrange, which is where fire discipline comes into play. In training, this is very hard to replicate. If you've been to a Sage Dynamics class, you've seen this before. This is a scenario uh, that I'll put students through at least once a class, in which the student faces up range while his classmates arrange the targets to tell a general really quick story. There can be one, two, maybe three threats. 
Um, once the targets are set up without the student's knowledge, he is given either a verbal or audible, or I should say an audible or visual cue, mostly an, an audible cue because that's the easiest way to initiate. The student turns around and has to assess and deal with the situation as it's presented. And the one thing I regularly see is my no-shoot targets get muzzled. Now, it's training, uh, but training is something that we do so we can behave effectively in real life. So should those no-shoot tar no targets get muzzled? No, they shouldn't. If you have to point the direction in the no-shoot targets in order to hit the threat, then that's just life. Uh, those situations have taken place and they will take place again. That's where marksmanship and understanding and realistic understanding of your own skill level comes into play. This is a very hard um, situation in order to get an effective shot on the bad guy. Uh, and I can make it worse, and real life can make it worse, by the people being even more compact. Of course, the argument can be made, well, if the guy's got a gun, people are going to spread out and flee from him, and he'll be standing there perfect, a halo light will come down for the heavens, I'll hear harps, and I'll be able to take that perfect shot I've always dreamed about. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe not. It depends on the situation, it depends on the reaction time, um, and I don't like to get into the predictive nature of trying to, well, predict the future. I can't say, with any degree of certainty, what will happen if you have to defend yourself, especially in an environment where there's a lot of people. Uh, and keep in mind that we're out on an open range right now. If I take these same targets and set, up, set them up in a 14 by 14 room, um, the lobby of a movie theater, uh, the hallways of an office building, things get a little bit more complicated because now the environment is constricting the target's ability to move, but it's also constricting the no-shoot or the innocent people's ability to flee from the gunman. There is one thing that should be noted um, when it comes to discrimination of the target. I think you'll notice that at torso level, or high thoracic. If we're dealing with adults, most people are going to be an average of the same size, with it plus or minus, you know, eight inches to a foot for adults. Uh, if there's children involved, that complicates things a little bit, but it does make it easier that the younger they are, because that means they're smaller. Now. You'll notice that there isn't much daylight between the thoracic cavities of these targets. However, there is pretty decent daylight between the heads. When you compress adults into an environment, daylight is usually only found at the cranial level, which means if I want to have a margin of error to the left and the right of my target, if I miss, the headshot, if I'm able to make it based on distance and circumstance, is going to be a wiser choice than trying to go to the high thoracic. Now we have even a tighter compression of people standing very, very close together. Maybe the environment dictates it. You know, you think about uh, there's plenty of environments, even though we like our bubble, we like those three to four feet of personal space and out in the public around people we don't know, but sometimes we have to sacrifice that personal space based on the environment. Uh, I know you live in an urban area, you've probably been in an area uh, such as riding a train, standing in a line, a movie, I mean, even gas stations. We temporarily suspend our desire for that three to four feet of personal space in order to uh, just get on with our lives, get done what we need to get done, and keep things convenient. Uh, so this is very possible, even if it's only a snapshot in time. I don't want people to think that, you know, this is tr me trying to replicate what's going to happen and what's going to remain the positioning of our, our bad guy and our no-shoots the entire time. But if I've got a threat in this crowd, uh, it complicates things even further because I've got even less daylight between my bad guy and my innocent bystanders who just happen to be in the way. Now, once he becomes violent and starts shooting, I can't expect uh, people to react. I don't necessarily know how they're going to react, but I can I can probably safely assume that at least some of them are going to flee in a way that's going to make it easier for me to access the threat. But in their fleeing, they may actually flee and get in my way if I choose to engage, if I positively know that this is a bad guy and I need to get my gun out and actually uh, stop the violence uh, to preserve human life. Uh, this is going to be a much more complicated situation, and this again factors back into uh, maximum daylight. Now, I am a headshot advocate. I firmly believe that the headshot is a place that we should train for just as much as we train and practice for high thoracic because it's the only off switch in the human body. Uh, and there's all kinds of arguments out there of, oh, the head moves around a lot. No, the body moves around a lot and the head's attached to it. And of course, oh, the head's a hard target to hit. It's smaller. You're right, it is. Uh, but the head does not change meaningful size regardless of presentation of the target. So as somebody turns around, the head roughly remains the same size which is not something you're going to get from the thoracic cavity torso body uh, of a person uh, unless their body shape just kind of helps you out there. Uh, people come in all kinds of shapes and sizes um, and that's definitely a factor in choosing your point of aim when we think about anatomy and where we want to put our bullets. If I'm in close proximity to a target, any one of these targets, uh, a headshot is something I can get if they stand still just long enough for me to get it. 
Uh, and people don't often dougie in gunfights, uh, so I don't have to worry about a lot of head bobbing necessarily until shots start flying. Again, that's anecdotal, but headshots have been taken on purpose in the past, they'll be taken on purpose in the future because sometimes that's the best place to put the bullets. Well, it's technically always the best place to put the bullets because the only off switch is in the brain, that brain stem. Pons, midbrain, medulla oblongata. It is a very small point of aim, however, shooting someone in their brain mass is going to be on average, more effective than shooting them in their cardiovascular system, which means they have to actually lose blood to become medically incapacitated, and that takes time. Whereas destruction of the central nervous system via the brain is gonna be much quicker and or instantaneous, depending on where the round actually hits and how deep it penetrates. Um, there are some ballistic factors we have to take into account with handguns, such as the closer you are to the edge of the skull, the more likely the round is to glance off and not actually enter. Uh, however, those factors sometimes the the risk is going to much much be much less or i should say the reward is going to be much greater than the risk because it's going to give you an instantaneous or near instantaneous t stop with proper round placement and if i this is my very first shot before anybody moves depending on your presentation to the threat what angle you're actually viewing the threat from a headshot may be the only viable choice and the other option, of course, is to wait for people to start to move around, which could needlessly endanger yourself and others. While the attempt at greater realism um, and the gravity of the situation is definitely a point of this video, I think it's important to mention that my main goal here is just to get people thinking about the fact that downrange isn't always clear. One of the cardinal safety rules is be aware of your target and what's beyond it. Uh, unfortunately, there's a troubling amount of people who don't factor in that second part. They're aware of their target and they're not paying attention to what's beyond it because they're tone deaf to what's beyond it because primarily where they shoot, be it indoor range, outdoor range, any kind of public range that you have access to, the backdrop is almost always going to be safe and we don't pay it the due attention we're supposed to. And I know this for a fact because this is a scenario, like I said, that I run for students in classes and a couple times a class I'll have a good guy line up on my bad guy put some rounds down range and hit one of my no-shoot targets. Now, these targets are cardboard, so it's very possible, <laughs> it's almost probable and, and, and expected for a round to pass through the cardboard and hit another target behind it because the cardboard's not really gonna slow the bullet down in any meaningful way. However, some of those shots that go by slip between two targets and they're a direct hit to my no-shoot because the accuracy wasn't there. The human body, handgun ammunition, if you hit a guy, is the round likely to exit? Maybe, maybe not. It's less likely, of course, than car, or I should say, yeah, it is less likely than I'd say than it would be with cardboard or paper. That's not the point, though. There should still be made, an attempt made, if possible, to clear the angle to the threat, and that means horizontally or vertically. In this, clo toast, this close of compression, if I were to shoot from a kneeling position up, I could likely clear, to a, to a greater degree, the backdrop to my threat if I was targeting, say, the head. Of course, the taller the bad guy, the closer you are to him, the more effective that's going to be. Um, but the environment itself, where's things taking place? Am I in the parking lot of an elementary school? Am I uh, in a movie theater? Am I in Walmart? Am I in a restaurant? All these factors play into things. Uh, so thinking about where those rounds are going to go is very, very important. Now, anecdotal again, but just talking to people who've been in shootings, my experience and, and others, um, People are a factor, but generally only so deep. And you guys have heard me talk about looking deep. In fact, uh, recently when I did my, my video series on the fundamentals, when I talked about uh, sight picture and sight alignment, I talked about looking deep, looking past your bad guy when possible, which is physiologically difficult for us when our sympathetic nervous system is activated because we tend to want to just threat focus. And when we come back to that front sight, if we come back to that front sight, if we're using iron sights, Everything becomes blurry beyond that the further away, the more blurry it is, the less contrast we have, the less we're able to discern people. Uh, so that's a complication that is physiologically based and very, very hard to overcome, but it's definitely something you need to consider in your own personal practice. How are you preparing yourself to confront a situation not unlike this? Now I could add more targets, I could take targets away, but even dealing with three or four even dealing with two could become problematic if you haven't thought about, okay, how do I change and work angles? How can I practice to do that if my range doesn't allow me to? If your range doesn't allow any kind of free movement, then you've got to be doing this stuff in dry fire, and it only takes a couple of targets. Now, you don't have to buy these, even though they are awesome. This is the most inexpensive three-dimensional target on the market. Uh, it's available from Targets Online. Uh, it's called the TacDrop UTC. 
the targets themselves aren't super expensive. They're more expensive than paper. Uh, the shipping kind of sucks, but if you and a friend go in on them, they're pretty resilient. Uh, you're going to get a lot of use out of them, and they're very useful for this. You could buy them and only use them for this, and never actually shoot live rounds at them if your range doesn't allow to use them or, or to do that kind of practice. Uh, you could also use your buddies, uh, get a bunch of people together and run some airsoft, or, or if you have access to it, UTM simunitions, which is even better uh, than paper. Um, but it's more beneficial than trying to replicate this with two-dimensional targets for obvious reasons. A final word on this is just muzzle orientation, muzzle safety when we're not on threat. We always want to point our firearm in the safest direction possible. Because of, of decades and decades and decades of institutional inbreeding, that direction is generally down. There's nothing wrong with down depending on the surface you're dealing with and the environment. And this crowd of people, if I had to move through them or they were going to move past me, then down would be pretty safe because they're all adults. No big deal. There's nobody down on the ground, there's no children, no concerns such as that, there's no one seated such as in a restaurant, no one crouching behind cover. Everything would be great with that down position. Now, if I add one six-year-old to this equation and I want to move through this crowd or those people want to move past me, is down necessarily going to be the safest direction? Because now I have a little tyke who's going to move directly, potentially, into my muzzle because I'm pointing the gun down. What about up? Uh, very controversial, uh, generally referred to as temple index. Um, it's also just known as, you know, point the gun up in a safe direction and keep it indexed to where you can control it as you move in an environment. Of course, up can be a safety issue too if you've got people on the floor above you. But again, we're dealing with safest known direction. I'm going to go with the known over the unknown. If I have to point my firearm up in a two-story building when I'm on the ground floor because I know there's no shoots below me, such as people who had wounded, people who are crouching, small children, something like that, I'm going to go with the known safest direction and point the firearm up. Or point the firearm up into the right, up into the left, what have you. Uh, the, the gun should not exist in this magic box where it's just out or down, out or down, out or down. You need to be able to move your muzzle freely and think about moving your muzzle freely in order to confront situations such as this. If I were to move through this crowd of people, my safe known direction might change six times just based on how people move in reaction to how I'm moving, how they're reacting in order to, to or reacting to how I'm acting. Uh, these are things that we have to take into account when we factor in safe muzzle direction and muzzle discipline. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.